and then the issue of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which Senator Clinton pointed to as a success of the Clinton administration, um, she has now called for it to be re-examined, I guess would be a fair way of saying it. Senator Obama, the same with NAFTA. Uh, he had not voted for it, he was not in the Senate, uh, but um, he had said as a candidate in 2004 that he thought NAFTA and other trade agreements were overall pretty good for the country. Uh, he has certainly heightened and sharpened his criticism. On the war in 2002 in October, he gave a speech, uh, and it really is an extraordinary critique of the war, talking about um, many of the issues that I asked Vice President Cheney about. I asked Senator Obama um, how he came to such conclusions when others in Washington had reached such a different conclusion. He said, because I wasn't briefed. And he said it in a very, and he said it in a very serious way. Um, the question for Senator Obama has been, after speaking out against the war, when he came, was elected senator, uh, Senator Clinton is right. His voting record is exactly the same as hers. And you can track their uh, initial support for the war, support for the troops, and then evolving on uh, whether or not there should be a fixed date for withdrawal and whether or not there should be a, uh, a, a cutting off of funds, in which they both pretty much match up e evenly in that regard. <clears throat> uh, I think on the issue of transparency, Senator Obama has released uh, his income statements. Uh, he is now more and more talking about Tony Resco, uh, this fundraiser who uh, helped uh, him uh, pick out property in Chicago but had no financial interest in it. Um, so every candidate has strengths and weaknesses. And I don't think that we have to be judgmental in interviewing them, but we do must ask them about them. Uh, when I asked Senator Clinton back in September uh, about driver's licenses for illegal immigrants, which was being put forward by a governor by the name of Elliot Spitzer, you probably never, you never heard of him. Huh? <laughs> I don't know what happened to Elliot, but he... Uh, <clears throat> Um, it was a very serious question because it, to many uh, immigrants and to many people in the country, it it's really hit, epitomizes the, the, the emotion and substance of that debate. So too, when uh, I interviewed Senator Obama in Cleveland at the debate, he had just been um, endorsed by Louis Farrakhan the previous Sunday, two days earlier. And I asked him about Reverend Farrakhan's words and uh, also about Jeremiah Wright's words, who now has become much more visible because with the release of the videotape. Uh, and Senator Obama gave an answer there, that he condemned some of the things that Minister Farrakhan stood for and, and certainly <clears throat> disagreed with some of the things Reverend Wright had said. But he said his job was to try to unite the country. And the stories after that debate were largely about NAFTA, some side stories about Farrakhan, but very few references to Reverend Wright because it was a discussion, I described what Wright had said, but it didn't have the drama of those particular tapes. I think what we need to do as journalists and as a country when we look at these candidates is um, accept them as human beings who have sometimes been wrong about issues, but have often been right. And if they can explain to us where how they arrive at their positions and it, with as much specificity as possible, how they see them playing out. Uh, that's why I asked each of them about Iraq. The first debate, I asked if any Democrat on stage could pledge that all troops would be out of Iraq by the end of their first term. And none of them would, would do that. And that was on September 30th up in New Hampshire. By the time we got to Cleveland, uh, both Obama and Clinton said they would begin a withdrawal immediately and have troops out by 2009. And so there, <clears throat> what Lawrence Spivak told me about Meet the Press is that you learn as much as you can about your guest and his and her position on the issues and take the other side. And so I said, well, if you begin to take the troops out and you accelerate the withdrawal and Al-Qaeda begins to reconstitute itself or a huge, massive civil war breaks out, do you hold the option of going back into Iraq with more American troops? I wanted to find out. It wasn't something that I was dreaming. It's, it's something that could happen. It's something that John McCain is going to challenge them on. And so 
I, more and more as we go through this campaign, it is those kinds of questions that force the candidates to think, allow us to see them thinking, responding, reacting, and, and hopefully, in the end, I don't think voters sit with a clipboard and click off every issue. You have a general sense of your political philosophy, but as my dad says, you want to take their measure, you want to size them up. Can I see this person in the Oval Office with a crisis that is unknown today seeping under the door? How will they react? How will they respond? Uh, how will they represent our country, both here and abroad? And it's, um, I, anyone who decides to run for President of the United States has my utmost respect. I must tell you, it is grueling and grinding. And, I, and I'm sitting here watching them, and it's exhausting. To actually be doing it is a whole other art form. Yes? No, I, I, I agree with you, and I, I worry about it. Um, I, I've, I've watched every Meet the Press over the last 60 years. It's the longest running program in the history of the world, and most TV programs last 13 weeks. Some we lost the video, and I've read the transcripts, but by and large we have the video or certainly the audio. And I am amazed by the difference in the responses by the politicians. This program started in 47. In the late 40s, early 50s, the politicians were pretty responsive. They didn't have handlers and pollsters. And they realized that if they came to meet the press, they had to give a relatively honest answer. Um, and and that's, that's important. I remember there's an interview with, with uh, Mike Mansfield, the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, senator from Montana, um, who served in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, one of the few men in history. And the questioners ran out of questions. <laughs> because they would say, Senator, you know, is this treaty going to be uh, brought up to a floor through a vote? Nope. <laughs> Senator, are you going to support it? Yep. <laughs> uh, Senator, uh, do you think uh, you'll have enough votes to cut off filibuster? Maybe. <laughs> it it's just bounces off the page with his candor. I said, where is Mansfield when I need him? But I look at the information spectrum now, and um, you have to know who you are. Uh, I never did a program on O.J. Simpson. A lot of people decided that, well, we, there's a way into that. We can use that as a, a, a vehicle to talk about uh, criminal justice system and so forth. I understood what was going on. And people who wanted to watch the O.J. Simpson trial could watch it, and there were lots of outlets that they could see it. Um, and, I, and I felt there were a lot of other issues that were being underreported, and, and I stayed true to that. Um, and, and so too with, with so many of these other Britney Spears and so forth that saturates the airwaves. Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, I have called C-SPANs God's gift to electronic journalism. I watch it all the time. I love to see the political rallies and working the rope winds. And I, watched, I watch interviews in, in all different settings. Because someone on Meet the Press has a completely different way of dealing with questions than when they're on Oprah, or when they're on C-SPAN, or when they're on the morning shows and know it's a seven minute interview. But it doesn't mean you can't learn from all those different outlets. It's this that you need them all. Uh, they complement each other. Uh, for example, um, I remember Ronald Reagan was on Larry King one time, and um, he was being asked questions that were not particularly probing. Uh, but, no, 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 but, but it's Larry's style because he's eliciting information. He's not asking physicians on issues. But Larry said to him, what's it like being shot? And Reagan gave the most detailed description of what happened with the assassination attempt that I had seen or read anywhere. 
And, it was, and I called her, I said, man, that was a great question. It was a simple, straightforward question, and you got a response that no one else had ever gotten in that regard. So I watched John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and Jay Lynn, I watched them all, because I learned something about these people who want to be our leader, or want to be our president. Um, but I go back to what I said in my talk. You can't make tough decisions unless you can answer tough questions. What are you gonna do about Iraq? You have Social Security and Medicare, 40 million people now who are in those programs. In the next 12 years, it's gonna to double to 80 million. We all know that, that the baby boomers are retiring. And Bill Clinton in 1998 said you'll either have to reduce benefits by a third or double the payroll tax. It's stark, it's real. And instead, the candidates will say, well, we can grow our way out of it and try to skate to the next issue. Or I would never do anything to jeopardize Social Security. They asked Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. And <laughs> Social Security and Medicare, pensions and the defense budget are gonna, will be the entire budget. You'll, if, you, if you today continue what we're spending on Social Security, Medicare, pensions, and the, and the defense budget, you could close down the rest of the government, all of it, education, health, all of it, and you still have a budget deficit. That's what we're confronting. And I feel obligated to raise that kinds of issues. And they're not gonna get, you can't do it in a seven minute interview on a morning show. Uh, but you can do some things in those formats, and, and I salute them for it. But it is imperative that we continue the opportunity to sit face to face. It took a lot. You know, I interviewed every, all the presidential candidates, offered them a full hour during the campaign season last year. And until the end, several of them resisted. And only when I said to their campaigns, okay, you've had the invitation for one year, and this must be done before the Iowa caucuses. The other candidates have done it, and I'm gonna do a virtual interview. <laughs> I'm gonna come up and say, we've invited governor or senator. Uh, he chose not to be here today. If he was here, this is what I would ask. Senator, you said this, about ba 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 boom and then come back and have the empty chair. <laughs> and then go to the next question, come back to the empty chair, and then bring in, and you do this like for 15 minutes, which I reminded them would make a wonderful YouTube, uh, <laughs> understanding the new technology, which my son told me about five minutes ago, you know. Um, and then bring in a panel of people and discuss, you know, how would that candidate have answered it? And they, all the candidates realized, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> And so they all showed up. But it took that amount of pressure because they preferred to find formats where they didn't have to focus their thinking and really reach closure on issues. If you read any of the books written about the presidencies and if you talk to any of the staffs who served our presidents, they will say to a person, the only way we can get the president to focus on this issue and come to closure is by by knowing that he had to do a press conference or an interview, that he couldn't get away with waffling anymore. The gig was up. And that's how you get decisions made. People like to hold off making difficult decisions until they have to. Our job is to make them. And, and because it is imperative that we know what they're thinking now. I think of all our presidents, if we had known more about them, and I talked to Herb Block about this, about Richard Nixon and some of the darkness that resided in him, about Ronald Reagan and, and the whole Iran-Contra and, and some of his views towards whether it's okay sometimes to let the staff do what they want to do or, or to say, well, you know, the, the, in terms of what our ultimate goal is, it's okay, of Lyndon Johnson and some of the, the, the stubbornness that, that we saw in him in terms of Vietnam. It is remarkable what you, you, you can learn about people who want to be president if you do due diligence, and our job is a due diligence. I think we're out of time. We're out of time. We are. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.